Thank you for watching today's message from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Stoddard. Our message today is... Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Here again the words of our first lesson from Exodus chapter 7, the first plague, the plague of blood. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes out to the river. Confront him on the bank of the Nile and take in your hand the staff that was changed into a snake. Then say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, Let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness. But until now you have not listened. This is what the Lord says. By this you will know that I am the Lord. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile, and it will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die, and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams and canals, over the ponds, and all the reservoirs, and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in vessels of wood and stone. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water of the Nile, and all the water was changed into blood. The fish in the Nile died, and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. But the Egyptian magicians did the same things by their secret arts, and Pharaoh's heart became hard. He would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Instead, he turned and went back into his palace and did not even take this to heart. All the Egyptians dug along the Nile to get drinking water because they could not drink the water of the river. This is the word of our Lord. You may be seated. Dear servants of the one and only, the almighty Son of God, I've said it before, even in sermons, and I'm pretty sure I'll probably say it again. I think it's a wonderful practice, a very good thing to do while you're reading your Bibles, whether someone's reading it to you, having a devotion, or here at church, or at home, reading on your own, that while you're reading a Bible story, you stop in the middle and, and think about it, and ask yourself questions to help you understand. One of the best questions I think to ask ourselves is what would I have done if I were God in that situation? And we see that God so often does things very differently from the way that we would do them. And quite often the reason he does things differently than we might expect is because of his love and grace and mercy for us. So I'd like to apply that to this account that we just read from the first plague in Egypt, from Exodus chapter 7. For many of you, this is a pretty familiar story. Maybe you've heard it since you were in Sunday school as a little child. You learned about the plague of blood and all the other plagues that went with it too. So if that's the case, you have to stop in the middle and and almost pretend that you don't know what God is going to do. If this is a new story for you, a new Bible account, well then you don't have to pretend at all. The Israelites were down in Egypt. They were slaves there. If you remember, kind of rewinding a little bit ba backward to figure out how they got there, Joseph had invited his entire family to come down. There were still several years left in the famine, and Joseph had food that he had stored up in Egypt for people all around the world, so he invited his family, his 11 brothers and, and their wives and their children and his dad to come on down to Egypt, and he gave them a great place to stay. He provided them with food to last throughout the rest of the, the years of famine. Well, that group of people that came down to Egypt as about 70 people in number grew and grew over a period of about 400 years into a great big nation, perhaps millions of people, over a million people. So big this nation grew that the people of Egypt and Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, got worried that if they ever rose up and decided they didn't like being the, the low on, on the totem pole, they could 
they could kick us right out of here. They could destroy our own country. So Pharaoh and the Egyptians enslaved the people and used the Israelite people to build some of the great examples of Egyptian architecture, perhaps some of the ones that the country of Egypt is still so well known for today. But God had promised Abraham that he was going to bring his descendants out of Egypt one day, bring them back to the promised land of Canaan and and give them that land as their very own, a land flowing with milk and honey. As God's people groaned under the oppression that they were enduring there in Egypt because those Egyptian slave masters were not just beating and mistreating the people. In fact, Pharaoh was so concerned about this nation rising up against them that he had ordered the Egyptian baby, or the, excuse me, the Israelite baby boys to be thrown into the Nile River and drowned in order to keep this nation of Israel weak and prevent them from growing any stronger. So God sent his servant Moses and Moses' brother Aaron to deliver his people from Pharaoh's power and bring them out of Egypt into the promised land of Canaan. God had already told Moses and the people of Israel his plan and his motive for bringing them out of Egypt. He wasn't going to do it quietly. He wasn't going to do it discreetly. He was going to make a large display of his power so that people would know that he is the one true God and they are his people. Even the unbelieving nations, including Egypt and other nations around, were going to hear about how God had come to the rescue of this people and they were going to be in awe and wonder. And many of them would shake with fear. Our God is glorified when he comes to our rescue. And there up to this time had never been such an amazing, such an awe-inspiring rescue as God was going to enact for his people. Never before had the Lord of heaven and earth chosen a specific nation, a specific group of people to deliver them that they would be his own nation and display his almighty power among them. The Lord had sworn in in the chapter before in Exodus, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. And then he repeats his initial statement, I am the Lord. Clearly, God's purpose in delivering the people of Israel in a great and powerful way was to show his dominion as the Lord of heaven and earth. Not only was he going to display it to his own people, he was also going to display it to the people around, to even the unbelieving nations around the people of Israel, that he is the Almighty Lord. No longer were God's people going to be enslaved and mistreated. No longer would they be kept under the thumb of the mighty Egyptians. They were going to be delivered. They were going to be rescued. And God was going to do it in an amazing way that showed his power, his dominion, and his love for his people. So if those are the parameters, let's stop there for a minute and think, if you were God in that situation, you wanted to bring your people out of Egypt powerfully and demonstrate your control over the entire universe, how would you do it? I mean... You can imagine any scenario you want to. God could tell his people to go ahead and riot like Pharaoh was afraid they were going to. Go ahead and rise up and then give them the strength and the weapons and the the ability to, to defeat their enemies and to go ahead and move right out of Egypt. Or God could have completely taken the battle out of it whatsoever. He could have just caused his people to up and walk out. And, and not enabled Pharaoh to be able to stop them in any way. Just like Jesus walked through the crowd, allowed during his life in Nazareth, just allow the people of Israel to walk straight out of Egypt. 
Maybe your ideas are something a little bit more fancy. God could have made a yellow brick road lined with flowers and trees appear in the wilderness so that his people could walk along a beautiful highway all the way to the promised land of Canaan. And no one could deny that this was an act of God and that he wanted his people to be brought out of Egypt. Like I said, your imagination's the limit. You could do whatever you want. But God doesn't do any of these things. The true God is not limited by our imaginations. But I still don't think, unless you know the story already, that any of us would have imagined or guessed that our God, the God of loving grace and mercy, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, would have taken the Nile River and turned the entire thing into blood. It just doesn't seem like something that we would think right off the top of our heads that that would be the choice for what he would do. In fact, God, through a series of ten plagues, each of them progressively worse than the one before, would cause horrific suffering, pain, and even loss of life in the land of Egypt. God delivered such a crushing blow to the nation of Egypt that they would never again rise on the world stage to be one of the most powerful nations in the world. They would never fully recover from those plagues for the rest of history. Now there were reasons why God chose to demonstrate his power by turning the Nile River into blood as he did in this first plague. See, Pharaoh wasn't just going down to the river to take a bath in the morning. God wasn't just making the water disgusting so, so Pharaoh would be a little bit grossed out as he tried to clean up. Pharaoh could have gotten ready in his own palace. He certainly had ways of, of preparing in the morning right there in the privacy of his own home. He didn't need to go down to the river to bathe. He was going down to the river because the river was part of their worship. The Nile River was such an important part of Egyptian society and life that they considered it a god that brought them life and fertility and and spread its life-giving silt over their fields every time that the river flooded so that they could grow their crops. They worshipped that river. They bowed down to it. They even brought sacrifices to the river. So the Lord was demonstrating his power over this false god by turning the river into blood at Moses' command. God turned this source of life for the Egyptians into a source of death and stench and disgust. And as a matter of fact, if we look through all ten of the plagues that the Lord brought against Egypt, we can see that they were very clearly designed by God's power to demonstrate his dominion, his rule over the false gods of Egypt. With a little bit of research, we can connect every single plague to a direct attack on one or more of the Egyptian gods. Maybe you've heard of the Egyptian sun god, Re. Well, when God caused darkness to fall over the entire land of Egypt, that was certainly an affront to the Egyptian sun god's power. Egyptians considered frogs to be sacred, and then God has a plague where frogs infest the land. Another plague that God brought against the, the Egyptians was a plague on their livestock, where all of the livestock in Egypt died. Well, livestock was an important part of the Egyptian worship too. Many of their gods had uh, heads of bulls or, or uh, were personified by a bull or something to that effect. God showed his power over the Egyptian false gods by these plagues. He also clearly revealed his power as the one true God to all of the Egyptians and this hard-hearted Pharaoh. To God's people, these amazing acts of power brought deliverance and freedom. But to the Egyptian people and to Pharaoh himself, these very same acts brought destruction and judgment. During the season of Epiphany, 
we focus our attention on how our Savior reveals himself throughout his ministry as the Almighty Son of God. Today we heard in our gospel lesson how Jesus did a wonderful miracle, changing water into wine. John calls it a miraculous sign that Jesus did so that his disciples would believe in him. God tells us about these wonderful acts of power that he does, changing water to wine, delivering his people from Egypt with mighty acts of power. All throughout his word, everywhere you read, you see God acting powerfully on behalf of his people. He shows that these things to us so that we today would believe in him and put our faith and trust in him too. Whenever we read God's word, listen to it and worship or read it on our own at home, we are witnessing again and again these signs of our God's power and love. We see how he delivered his people from trouble in the past, how he used those troubles and pains and suffering to draw his people closer to him. Sometimes he tells us that he actually sends trouble and suffering into the lives of his people in order to help them and draw them closer to him again. We see in God's word how he deals with his disciples when they are weak in faith and how he lovingly but firmly corrects those who are not living their lives in accordance with his will. When we witness these things happening in God's word, we learn to see how our God shows his love and power for us in our lives and rescues us from situations that we will find ourselves in. God can and does reveal his glory and his power to us still today in a number of different ways. Sometimes our God reveals his delivering power and glory by keeping hardships from coming into our lives. We will never know how many hardships, how many trials, how many pains and sufferings, how many attacks of Satan God has kept completely out of our lives, completely from touching us whatsoever. He says our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Satan wants to tear apart our faith, to gobble it up and tear it to shreds, to get us to turn our hearts away from the Lord. It's a testament to God's delivering power and glory that you are here today listening to his word and praying to him, praising him for his acts of love and deliverance for you throughout your life and, of course, in history, as we read in in the Bible, too. But you know what? Even though this might be the way that we prefer God would show his power in our lives, keeping hardships away, keeping pain and suffering away, because of our foolishness, because of our lack of faith and trust in the Lord, when God completely keeps suffering away from our lives, it doesn't draw us closer to him. We forget to daily thank him for keeping us safe. We don't recognize this as a demonstration of God's power and rescue for us. And so God has other ways of revealing his glory to us too. At times, God shows us his glory by allowing troubles, even sending troubles and hardships into our lives. Instead of keeping them away from us, he allows them to impact our lives and even bring us suffering and pain. But then, God in his almighty delivering, rescuing power promises that he's going to be with us every step of the way and that he will give us the strength and the healing that we need to make it through. Quite often he delivers us through natural means, the normal course of events. He causes a problem to work itself out. He gives us the resources to overcome whatever struggle we might have been facing. He grants our bodies the ability to heal. He gives us doctors and friends who will bring us the help that we need. He strengthens us and strengthens our faith so that we won't give in to temptation when we face it. Whenever we see these acts of power, Do we recognize the hand of our almighty God working on our behalf? We should. And again, we should give him praise and thanks for his delivering power for us. But sometimes God chooses not to work out 
our problems by natural means. Sometimes he demonstrates his power for us just as he did for the people at the wedding at Cana or the Israelites enslaved in Egypt. Sometimes he works out these, he works his rescue for us through miracles and he still works powerfully through miracles today. Maybe you've witnessed miracles in your own life. I remember one young man who was studying with me at the seminary. One morning in class, he got a phone call that nobody would ever want to receive. His wife had been involved in a car accident. She had slid sideways on an icy freeway there in Milwaukee and had actually crashed her car, I believe it was sideways, into a bridge abutment. And from what I heard, if I'm remembering correctly, this was 12, 15 years ago, her car had actually wrapped around the bridge support. And the firefighters had to use the jaws of life to get her out of the car. And the emergency personnel who were there on the scene were all expecting the worst. Only to have this young lady step out of the car and be absolutely fine except for a few scrapes and bruises. By the admission of people who were there, it was a miracle that this woman walked away from that accident. God works in miraculous ways still in our lives today. Not all of the miracles that happen in our lives are quite so completely obvious. As Christians, as believers, who know that our God acts this way for us, we need to keep our eyes open to see the wonderful demonstrations of his power and remember, once again, to give God thanks for his delivering rescue. Finally, God promises that he will deliver us in his own time by taking believers to be at home with him in heaven. There he puts an end to all of our trials, all of our sufferings, all of our pain for good. And there we will see his glory completely on display and we'll no longer need eyes of faith to trust that it is him at work. We will see his glory with our own eyes. But until then, we need to be reminded every day of how our God uses his power to rescue us, his people. God displays his saving power for us today, right now, most clearly and most powerfully in his word. There in his word, he often allows us to see into his motives for allowing people even people that he loves, his followers, to to suffer and endure pain and temptation. There in his word, God often shows us the results of his works, his acts of power and deliverance for his people. But it is in God's word that he shows us his greatest act of deliverance that far outweighs rescuing a million people from slavery in Egypt by ten miraculous plagues. He sent his son who came into this world as a human being, who lived a perfect life in your place, who suffered and died on the cross, taking on himself the punishment that we deserve for all of our sins and rising again from the dead, defeating death and Satan for good so that you and I could be given salvation as a free gift so that salvation was won for the entire world so that all who believe in it are baptized will be saved. Surely the God who demonstrates his almighty power to deliver us like this will not let anyone or anything steal away our hope of heaven. He will not let Satan pluck you out of his hand. He wants you to be welcomed into his arms one day in heaven. When God puts his power and display, power on display for us, In all of these ways, many of these ways, as he did for the Egyptians or for the Israelites in Egypt and for the people at the wedding of Cana, we ought to follow the example of those disciples, not the example of Pharaoh. How dare we turn our hearts away from the Lord 
and not even consider, not even take to heart the things that he is doing for us. Let's do as his disciples did and do as our Lord intends when he works on our behalf. Believe in him as the one true God, the Savior of all the world. Amen. Please stand. And to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Stoddard. Join us for worship at the following times, like us on Facebook, or visit our website for audio and video sermons or to find out more about our congregation. God bless your week in the Lord.